Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, sorry to hear the bus was late, but we're ready to go now. Um, I wanted to warn you right now that there are going to be points in this talk where I'm going to ask you questions, and I'm going to wait for you to answer. So we may get stuck here, and we may be all day and never have a coffee break if I don't get some answers out of the audience. So this is just to let you know now, and uh, so you can listen and uh, bear that in mind. Maybe it'll be five, ten minutes into the first one. Okay, um, quick correction on the biography, which is slightly out of date. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about my background, um, which will correct a couple of things, and then we'll move into the technical part of the talk. Let me also mention that in addition to me asking you questions, you are welcome to ask me questions anytime. I know that's probably not the normal protocol here, but I'm breaking protocol, and if there's anything that's confusing, just raise your hand and ask me. Okay, so let me start just with a little bit of my background, which is slightly unconventional. My undergraduate degree is in trumpet performance. So things are a little different in the United States, and you can go to college and major in anything you want, including playing the trumpet, and after that, you can become a computer science professor. So there's a lot of flexibility in what you, what you can do. I've been spending some time here in Sri Lanka with students, and I understand here it's a lot different. You really get tracked into your major when you're quite young. So uh, you can see that my background's a little bit non-traditional. I did, however, get a computer science PhD. Um, I then went to IBM, where I worked at a research center in California for five years. Um, I'm a little embarrassed when she read my bio about how long ago everything was. I've been at Stanford now for 23 years, so a very long time. I was the department chair um, of the computer science department uh, until 2014. Uh, you'll be meeting the current computer science department chair from Stanford later on today, as a matter of fact. Um, I served a couple years as an associate dean of engineering until very recently, actually yesterday, in fact, was the day that I decided to step down from that position. And I am currently on a year-long sabbatical traveling all over the world offering free short courses on big data. And actually, the first stop in this uh, tour is Sri Lanka. So I've been here for about a week and a half. Uh, I taught some courses uh, in Colombo and also in Kandy. In addition to teaching about big data, I've also been conducting workshops on design thinking and creative problem solving. So I've been here for a while. I've been a little bit immersed. I've met a whole bunch of students and professionals, and it's been a whole lot of fun. Uh, just for a sample, my next stop, you well, after vacation in the Maldives, but after that, I'm actually going to go briefly to South America, to Colombia, and then I'll be coming back to this part of the world and visiting Bhutan and Thailand and Vietnam, Indonesia, India, and I have a whole, um, a whole schedule plan bringing big data courses to students worldwide. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Today I was invited to give a keynote about my research. And so today is going to focus on research and not in teaching about big data, but rather research in the area of data management. So first I want to describe how I've gone about selecting research topics in my career. So I actually found a recipe for, for research topics. So watch closely if you're looking for research topics. Um, because this is a recipe that works at least very well in my research area, but I've been told by many people that the same recipe can apply to their own research area with just small adjustments. So here it comes, a recipe for finding research topics. In the database area, a recipe for finding a topic is to pick some simple but fundamental assumption in the way, in my case, database systems are built. You could translate this to other areas. So pick a, f a simple fundamental assumption and see what happens if that assumption goes away. So drop that assumption. I'll give you examples. Once you drop a fundamental assumption about a particular research area, 
you really have to reconsider a, many different aspects of that area. Again, particularly in databases, you have to reconsider how you do data management and query processing. And at least as a professor in the university, taking this approach where you have to reconsider many different aspects of something allows you to have many PhD theses, so different students can work on different aspects once you have to reconsider many of them, and I'll come to examples in a moment. And the other thing that I'd like to do with my research group is to build prototypes. So if you break an assumption about a database system, then you have to build a new type of database system that doesn't make that particular assumption. Okay, so let's go straight into what some of these simple but fundamental assumptions might look like. How many people here have taken at some point in their life a basic course in databases, introduction to databases of some type? How many people? Raise your hand high. Okay, good. So you're going to follow this talk and you're also all going to be ready to answer my questions. Okay, so here's a first simple but fundamental assumption in databases, which is that when you want to build a database, the first thing you do is declare what the structure of the database is, what the schema is. You'll say I'm going to have this table, it's going to have these particular columns of these particular types and another table, and once you've declared the structure of the database, then and only then can you start loading data and doing something with it. If you drop that particular assumption, you get what became known as semi-structured data or schemaless data. And in that case, you're not declaring the schema in advance. The structure of the data comes with the data and it can change over time. Here's another fundamental assumption made by traditional database systems, which is that the data is persistent, it sits typically on a disk, it's relatively stable, it's updated occasionally, but most of the time it's sitting there, you've got your big hunk of data and you ask questions about that data and get answers. If you drop that assumption and look at things differently, you might operate on data streams. And a data stream is not data sitting on a disk, but it's data that's coming at you very rapidly. It could be stock trades, for example. And instead of asking a question on a stable data set, you'll, ha you'll register your question. As the data streams by, answers will be emitted. So it's a different model. Another example. Data elements contain known values. Well, that might seem obvious to you, but in fact, a lot of data has what's known as uncertain data or sometimes probabilistic data. Okay, and I'm going to give examples of all of these. And lastly, Data ga is gathered and processed by computer. It's actually quite popular now to have humans or crowdsourcing involved in data management, data cleaning, query processing, and we call that crowdsourced data. So here's four examples where I've taken a just basic assumption about how database systems work, dropped that assumption, and it's opened up a whole research area. When you need to consider all aspects of uh, data management and query processing, what does that mean? In the database setting, it means you have to define what your data model is, what the, the general framework or structure of your data is. Is it tables? Is it graphs? Is it documents? You need a query language. How do you ask questions about data? You need to figure out how to store the data, how to index it so you can get at it efficiently. You need to figure out how to process queries and how to optimize them so they run very efficiently how to have multiple things going on at the same time, which is concurrency control, or recovery, what to do when the database system crashes and you need to bring it back to a consistent state. And then, of course, the interface for how applications and users will work with the database. So for all the examples that I gave, most of these aspects have to be reconsidered in that new setting where that assumption is dropped. Now let me talk about how I have approached a new topic. So let's say I've decided I'm going to work on data streams. Again, all aspects have to be reconsidered, but I've taken a specific approach of the ordering in which I consider them. Before you can do anything with data, you need to understand what the model is, how you describe the data, how the data is, uh, what the data looks like to the application and user. 
And until you know what the data is going to look like, say it's going to be a graph, until you understand that, you can't understand how to ask questions. So first thing is to define the data model. Second is to figure out how you're going to ask questions over the data, so the query language. And then I'm going to put all of those remaining four things into implementation considerations. Okay? And I'm going to even take another step and say the first two, data model and query language, are foundations, and the rest of it is implementation. And I'm dividing it that way because I have a strong principle in my research that I'll start with foundations, and only when that's finished and I really understand the data model and the query language will I move on to implementation. And I mention that because in research in database systems, frequently that is not how it's conducted. People frequently will almost start with the implementation and then try to retrofit the foundations. And that is a, is a valid approach, but a different approach. And this has been my approach. And I, in fact, go so far as to say I've built my entire career on taking this approach to the work that I've done. Okay? So let me tell you what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk. I'm going to start with uh, a dubious beginning in database. And may, you may not know what dubious means. It sort of means doubtful or bad. And I'm going to talk about the SQL language and specifically come back to that question of understanding the foundations before implementing. And we'll see that in the origins of the SQL language, there were some ambiguities in the meaning of the language itself. So I'm going to say that was a bad beginning for databases in terms of understanding foundations before implementation. Then I'm going to do a warm up from some of the earliest work I did when I was working at IBM in the area of active databases, also known as triggers. And then I'm going to talk briefly about several of these projects I had based on the dropped assumptions. I'll talk about semi-structured data, data streams, and probably uncertain data, and almost certainly not crowdsourced data. There won't be time to cover that today. For some semi-structured data, I'm actually going to talk about user interface issues. For data streams, about query language. For uncertain data, about data model. And crowdsourced data, had I gotten, and I had time, would be algorithmic challenges. OK, so let's start with uh, the SQL query language. So I'm sure all of you who raised your hand and studied databases studied SQL. Everybody does. So SQL, or SQL as it's known, is meant to be what's called a declarative language. That means that the meaning of a query in that language should be independent of how it's executed. So I could say, I want to retrieve all of last week's temperature measurements, and that's what I want, last week's temperature measurements. It doesn't matter how the system goes about getting it. So you don't write something that says, open a file, read the first line, do something, read the second line, do something, and so on. That would be an imperative language. Declarative says, I just want, I want the temperature measurements. Give them to me any way you'd like. That's the premise of the language. But I would say not everyone thinks of it that way. And in fact, for some, I think the only understanding of the language is to think about how it's executed, not what the queries mean. And I'm going to give a very simple example. Let's suppose we have a table called T with an attribute called A, let's say. So it's just a table with one column, an attribute A, and a bunch of values. And what we want to do, where this is actually a modification operation, which is also written in the SQL query language. We want to decrement, subtract one from all the values in T that are below average. OK? So since all of you have studied SQL, or most of you have, you should be able to understand, you read this. But even if you'd never seen SQL, this is pretty easy to read. So this says, Update T, the table, set the value for A, that's our one column, to A minus 1. So this is decrementing the value in each row where that value is less than the average value in the table. Okay? So this down here is the, the second line, that's the average value. And for those that are less than that average value, subtract 1. Okay? This is basic SQL. Everybody can read this, right? OK. Now, I hope you can all see this portion of the slide. Can you all see the bottom? OK. So 
We're going to start with a table that has three values in it, four, one, and two. What are the values in the table after this update command is executed? So the average of the table is something over two, right? Yeah. Okay, so what is somebody, I'm going to just wait. I want you to tell me what values are in the table after the command. It's going to be three values, I can tell you that. So that's for starters. You should have three numbers. What three numbers are they? Zero. Zero, four, zero. Four, zero, one. Four, zero, one. Does everybody agree with that? Four, zero, one. Because the average is a little bit over two, so you decrement the second and third one. Anybody think there's a possibly different answer? I'm going to tell you that, there are, that if you ran this in 1980-something on uh, you know, IBM, whatever, at the time, you wouldn't necessarily get that answer. There's another answer that you sometimes got. Two different answers for the same query. Anybody think of another answer you might get? Yes, it depends on how average A is computed or specifically when. Yeah. Right, thank you. Good, you're into it. All right, wait till I get the really hard one later. Okay, so if there's two possibilities, and the one that you said is the right one, I think, right, and that's what you would get today. So today, the way this would run is you'd compute the average, which is somewhat over two, you'd find all the items that were below average, that would be one and two, and you'd subtract one from each one, and you get four, zero, one. Here's another thing that could happen. And I'm telling you, in the origin of the databases, some systems did it one way and some did it the other. The system could take the first value four, and it could say, okay, I have a four. Let me compute the average. The average is a little bit over two, so um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to decrement the value that's going to stay at four. Then it takes the second one, the one, and it says, okay, let me compute the average. The average is a little over two, so I'm going to subtract one, and now I've got a zero there. Now I've got four, zero, two. And then it comes to the two, and it computes the average again, and now the average has changed, and it doesn't decrement that. So the way this query was being executed was affecting the answer, and that's just completely wrong from it, the point of view of a declarative language. You need to understand what it means before you implement it. So I say that's bad news. Here's even worse, I'm gonna make a small change. I'm gonna say decrement above average values in table T. Okay, I just made a small change to, and I changed this to A. And don't even worry about the numbers here. Does anybody know what can happen with that one if it's implemented the wrong way? It's a little trickier. Any thoughts? So this one can actually get into an infinite loop because it keeps it decrements values and that average is going up down, so more above average, and then it goes down and more above average and so on. It can actually go on and on. Okay? So that I consider double bad news. So these were some unfortunate things in the history of SQL. So we could say, okay, well, people weren't worried about it, I mean people weren't thinking about it back then, everything's good now. There are still bad things going on in SQL in the language. And I'll give you another example. Let's suppose we want to compute the average temperature for countries. So we have a database that has country, city, temperature. And we want to do is a standard group by aggregation. So this, again, if you've taken a database class, this should be familiar to you. I'm saying, I didn't put a from clause in here. I just, but you'll understand what I'm saying. Select the country and the average temperature, and I'm grouping by country, okay? So here's some data. I've got two countries, France and the USA. And so you can just do this in your head. 
the answer to this query would be France with an average temperature of 15 and USA with an average temperature of 8. So it groups by country and then within each country computes the average temperature for that country. Very straightforward. Every database system will give you the same answer for that. Now we add city. Now we say we want to give the average temperature for a country, and we also ask for city. What do you think that should do? Should do. some of my own early work, and this was in the area of active rules or database triggers. How many people have used triggers in an application or in a homework assignment? Okay, a few. So triggers are a quite popular feature in databases now. When I was working at IBM way back in that year that was mentioned at the beginning, uh, triggers were not yet in database systems, and so we had a research project where we were looking at them. And what a trigger says is that you, is that you, you actually put this object in your database, and it monitors the database, and it says when some action occurs, if a condition holds, then perform additional actions automatically. And an action could be an insert, a delete, or an update to the database. The condition might be expressed using SQL. The actions might be expressed using SQL. I'm going to be slightly abstract with my example, and I'm going to start with an easy one. I'm going to put in two triggers in a sales database. So this database is having people, is going to have people who are making sales, and those sales will be inserted in the database. And the first trigger says, when a new sales is inserted, if it's greater than 500, then give the seller a bonus of 100. So it's going to sit there automatically monitoring the sales and giving bonuses. OK. The second is going to say, when new sales are inserted, if the total sales exceed 1,000, everybody's salary goes up by 10%. Okay. 
Let's suppose in a batch we insert three sales. Mary sold 600, John sold 300, and then Mary sold another 400. What happens? This is easy. How about this side of the room? What happens? Or right the middle, or the right, any part of the room. This one's easy. Is that a hand up? Oh, scratching his head, okay. <laughs> Anybody? Mary gets a bonus. Yeah, obviously Mary sold more than 500, so she gets a bonus, right? Yep, bonus of 100. Okay, what else? Then they all get a salary increase because Mary, because the total sales is 1,300. So after Mary's final sale there, it's gone over 1,000, they all get an increase. 600, 900, 1,300, they all get a salary increase. Uh, say that again? Yes. The, well, the, no, because the uh, first one was that the sale had to be greater than 500. Yeah, so this one is supposed to be easy. <laughs> Um, but you might even be getting at the difficulty. I'm gonna, so Mary gets a 100 bonus and a 10% raise, and John gets a 10% raise. Here's the tricky example, okay? The tricky example, I made a couple changes. One is that when sales are greater than 500, the seller gets a raise, okay? And then this says stayed the same when the total sales are 1,000, increased by 10%. And now I'm gonna insert 800, 300, and 600. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of issues of what happens now. I'm not even gonna ask you to answer because the answer is not obvious. So first of all, how many raises does Mary get? Does she get one for this sale, sale over 800 and another one when she sold more than 600? We have to decide, what does it mean? How many times has everyone's salary increased? The first time it went over 1,000 and again there or just once? And which of Mary's salaries is the 10% raise applied to? There are no obvious answers to these. The point being, there's no obvious answers. So if you think SQL is tricky and people got it wrong, this is really tricky. So in the work that we did in this area, we had, uh, we had a goal in the foundations of de developing a semantics for triggers that was well-defined in all cases, that was understandable, that was expressive and that could be implemented efficiently. It's not easy, it was quite challenging to do. We did, I think we achieved that. This was a long time ago. What we did, did have an effect on the SQL standard for triggers. The SQL standard for triggers ended up actually simplifying a little bit what you were even allowed to say. Part of the standard was a set of restrictions on what you could say to avoid those tricky things happening, which is a fine thing. As long as it's understandable, making simplifications to make sure that it's understandable and well-defined is a fine approach to take. And that, that's what, what, what happened with database triggers. Okay. The second topic I want to talk about is semi-structured data. Semi-structured data is the, when I, meant, I mentioned earlier, the area when you don't have a schema, you don't have a structure for your data, the data, the structure of the data may change rapidly. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we did in that area way back in the 1990s. So we had a project where we were working on heterogeneous database systems and data exchange, and we decided back then that a good model for our data, when it's semi-structured, would not be the square tables or anything like that, but labeled graphs. And we called it the object exchange model, okay? And we, it was directed labeled graphs. Uh, this should be familiar to people in general. It's not complicated. This is a restaurant database. We have a route to our graph. We have two restaurants. This restaurant has name, entree, phone, owner, manager, name, entree. This one's a bar. Down here are the values at the bottom. 
And so you can see the general idea of a directed labeled graph. Now let me just mention that not long after that time, semi-structured data, people, for semi-structured data, people started using XML. I assume people are familiar. How many people are familiar with XML? Everyone, good. So this is that same exact data in XML. It's just that the labels became tags. It's no big deal. This is exactly the same. Actually now JSON is very popular for semi-structured. Exactly the same. Just you know, a textual form of the same type of thing, okay? But we were using semi, uh, this graph, and that's what we're going to use. And the problem we addressed was that semi-structured data doesn't have a schema. Well, that was the whole point. In fact, it was called schemaless or self-describing data. The problem is that database management systems rely on a schema for a lot of things. It's the way database management systems are built. They store statistics using the schema. They build indexes using the schema. If you want to check whether a query is valid, it's mentioning right, the right things with the right types, you use the schema. If you write select star to know what star expands to use the schema for browsing, query building, it's really key to a database system. Okay. Our solution was something that we called a data guide. And the data guide is a structural summary of a semi-structured database. Effectively, what we were doing is extracting the schema from the data, OK? So here's the reminder of what our database was with the restaurants. Just to remember this, again, you could think of it, if you like, as XML. The formal definition of a data guide is, first of all, that it has to be an, an object or a graph in the same model. So it has to look like a database. In fact, in general, schema information is stored in databases. Second, is stored in the, in the model of the database. Second, every path of labels, so every unique path in the database must appear exactly once in the data guide. Remember, we're trying to summarize the structure of the database in the data guide. And furthermore, there can be no extraneous paths. So you can't have any path in the data guide that's not in the database. OK? So that's the formal definition for this particular example. Of course, databases are generally huge, and you want to have a fairly small data guide. For this example, here is a data guide. So you can see that it's smaller, and it follows the definition. It's an object in our data model. Every path in the database, we had like restaurant entree, restaurant owner, appears exactly once in the data guide. And every path in the data guide appears in the database. OK? I will mention that our data model allowed cycles. If you had a cycle in the database, that would end up as a cycle in the data guide. OK. We use the data guide, for example, for indexing and statistics. We would store the object IDs of corresponding objects in the data guide. So in this particular node, we would store the fact that in our original database, items 6, 10, and 11 were reached by a path restaurant entree. Or here, items 2 and 3 were reached by restaurant. We would also store sample values in the data guide. For example, restaurant names would look, or re would look like these names. We used it for interactive queries. This looks very old fashioned now, but in 1997 or whatever, this was quite modern interface, where this was actually a database about the people in our database research group. And this was the data guide, and you could browse the structure of the database, and then you could actually add conditions and launch queries from the data guide. Again, that would be completely normal now. It was pretty unusual then, particularly for a database without a schema. There were a number of challenges in that work. One of them is that the I gave you a definition of the data guide, but the data guide is not always unique. So there could be different data guides for the same database. Okay? So we de made a definition of the one that we liked best called the strong data guide. It's not always small. Sometimes it can be large, and we would actually relax the definition and have approximate data guides. And constructing the data guide from the database was similar to converting a non-deterministic finite automaton to a deterministic one, so it, it could be quite challenging as well, especially for graph-structured data. 
Data guides is one of my very favorite, personally favorite research results of my whole career, I would say. It had challenges of every type. We had to define the foundations. We had to develop algorithms. We implemented it. It had applications of every type. We used it for storage in the database, for query processing, for the user interface. And I like the name, too. I always thought it was a very catchy name. I would say among all my results, this is the one that has had the most tenacity, longevity. By that, I mean people are still talking about data guides and using data guides now, 25 years later. So this one was quite successful, I would say. You wouldn't have known it at the time, but it's, uh, it's still alive. OK. I'm going to talk. Um, let's see. I'm actually going to give you a choice, because I assume we want to catch up on time a little bit. OK. So you have a choice between data streams, where we're going to talk about language, or uncertain data, where we're going to talk about m data model. And everybody has to vote. And if not everybody votes, I just leave. OK. So how many would like to hear about data streams? How many would like to hear about uncertain data? OK. And that's great because uncertain data has a really hard problem at the end. Woohoo. Okay. Um, I mean, really hard. But, um, and I will tell you, well, we'll come back to it when I get there. Okay. Um, uncertain databases. We are going to talk about a specific application, which, as, as an example, so the whole, everything I'm going to do is through this example. Uncertain, in this uncertain database, we're going to have a very simple, very simple crime-solving database with two tables. So now think relational at this point. Forget the um, active databases. Forget the, uh, the semi-structured database. Think about relational databases. We have a table called saw that has tuples in it saying witnesses saw, saw a car at the crime. So we're trying to solve a crime. We have data associated with that crime. This is going to be a list of witnesses and cars they saw at the crime. And separately, we'll have a list of cars that are driven by people. OK? I'll get to some examples. Don't worry if you don't read relational algebra. But what this is saying is that we're going to say that a suspect of our crime is a person who drives a car that was seen by witnesses. So we do a relational join of the two tables, saw and drives. So we join it on the car value. So we'll join every pair of tuples that have the same car. And that will give us people who drive a car that was seen at the crime. Very simple. We should be done, except let's make this data uncertain. So the first table will actually say, there are witnesses who say, I might have seen a car. I'm not sure. Or I might have seen this kind of car or that kind of car. I'm not sure. And the drive might be, I think a certain person drives a car, but I'm not sure. And this is actually very common. I mean, obviously, in crime solving, this would be the case. So. Let me go a little bit about uncertain databases. Abstractly, uncertain databases capture the set of all possible certain databases. So we might have Kathy who saw either a Honda or a Mazda. We can think of that as two options in our database. Either it contains Kathy Honda or Kathy Mazda. Amy might have seen an Acura. She's not sure. There's a Honda that was drive, driv, that's been driven by either Billy or Frank, I'm not sure. And now I'm going to show a representation for this type of data. And the representation is going to have in the database alternative values. And it's also going to have question marks, which we call maybe annotations. In the work that we did, we also had probabilities on these values, but I'm not going to use that today. But if you get interested, there are probabilities. OK. So here is a. Just a uh, representation, actually, of these particular points. This first tuple says Kathy saw a Honda or Kathy saw a Mazda. So this tuple can have two possible values. Either it's Kathy Honda or Kathy Mazda. You really need to listen carefully if you're going to get my puzzle. OK. This tuple says Amy Acura, and there's a question mark. That means this tuple can be either present or absent. 
So this table has four possible actual certain values. Two po the, the first tuple can be Kathy Honda or Kathy Mazda. The second tuple can be present or absent. So four possible ones. Amy Honda and the second one, I'm sorry, Kathy Honda and the second, Kathy Mazda and the second, or just Kathy Honda, just Kathy Mazda. Here we have a simple one where Billy drives a Honda or Frank drives that Honda, okay? All right, so that is our representation of the uncertain data. Here is the dilemma that we faced. This looked like a nice representation. We were designing a representation. Unfortunately, this representation is not closed. And by that I mean I can run a query, a regular relational query on this representation, and I cannot be able to represent the answer. So I'm going to run a query, and I can't actually encode the answer to that query. So this model is too simple. Because I, when, so it looks good for the data, but it turns out it's not great for the query answers. I am expanded the data here to include Jimmy, who drives a Toyota or a Mazda, and a Honda that's driven by Hank. And there's no question mark, so all of these exist. By the way, anybody notice anything interesting about my sample data related to genders, perhaps? All the criminals are men and all the witnesses are women. Just like real life, I think. OK. So here is our data. Now we run our query. You don't, again, have to read relational algebra, which says the suspects are going to be people who are in that join of the two tables. In other words, someone is a suspect if they might drive a car that might have been seen at the crime. OK. Here is what we get. We join the two tables, and we get a table that said Billy or Frank might be suspects, question mark. Jimmy might be a suspect. Hank might be a suspect. In our encoding, there are three possibilities here, Billy or Frank or nothing, times two times two. So there's three times two times six, 12 possible tables here from this one. OK. This is not the answer. It doesn't correctly capture the possible answers to this query. And in fact, I'm going to tell you, it cannot. It cannot. That we cannot write the answer to this query using these alternatives and question marks. This is a really hard problem, but let's see if anybody can get this. And I will tell you that I gave this example in uh, January at the ACM India conference. I had 1,000 people in the audience. And one very young student he was so excited when he got the answer to this, and he did. So does anybody know why? Can anybody describe what's wrong with this answer? Why this answer does not capture the answer to the query? When I was teaching the big data class, I brought some Stanford water bottles and caps and things to give away when people got the, uh, got the hard answers. Yes? Sorry? Yep. No, not quite. Well, maybe you're getting at the answer. I, I'm not sure. 
Not quite sure. Want to elaborate? No. Anybody else want to guess? No, I'm saying is that the GP makes the Toyota and the Mazda. Or either he either drove the Toyota or he drove the Mazda. One or the other. The Mazda is? Mazda is selected because uh, someone has seen the Mazda growing, right? Oh, um, I see. I'm not sure that's quite it, but I think you're headed in the right direction. Yeah, I think you probably are. So let me, let's, actually, let's focus on Jimmy here. So Jimmy saw either the Mazda or he saw the Toyota, right? So let's see, say that Jimmy saw a Mazda. So if Jimmy saw a Mazda, just I drive. Just I drive. Actually, I'm not sure this exam, that particular example, is going to work. Uh, yes, that'll work. If Jimmy saw the Mazda and Kath, uh, drove, drove, drove. If Jimmy drove the Mazda and Kathy drove and saw the Mazda, then Jimmy is going to be in the answer. Okay. So Jimmy saw the Mazda. Kathy, Jimmy drove the Mazda. Kathy saw the Mazda. Jimmy will be in the answer. But if Jimmy is in the answer, then Kathy cannot have seen the Honda. Okay, is everybody good? If Jimmy is in the answer, then Kathy saw a Mazda, not a Honda. If Jimmy is in the answer, then Hank cannot be in the answer because Hank drove, was driving a Honda. Okay? You can think of it as two scenarios. Kathy saw the Mazda or Kathy saw the Honda. So Jimmy and Hank cannot be in the answer at the same time. Jimmy can be in the answer or Hank can be in the answer, but not both. Does that make sense? Now for that particular case, you might think that you could put, make this to be Jimmy or Hank, but there are other dependencies that, you, that come out as well. I mean, I could go through all of them, but not all of these 12 possibilities are actual possibilities, and that's the key. Okay? And you can prove with a theorem that it is not possible to express all answers with just these encoding structures. Okay? So just going to finish this example very briefly. What we did is we added to our data model something called lineage. And lineage is keeping track of where things come from. So what we added here was that with the answer, and the, I'm not going to go into detail, we stored basically pointers to which values contributed to that answer. And then we added to the semantics the fact that you couldn't have in your answer two things that relied on conflicting values. And we proved that with data and lineage, we, ca we can capture every possible query result. So that was enough to, that made our model closed and in fact complete. Okay? So I'm just going to wrap up now. We're pretty much out of time. I didn't talk about data streams, but that we worked on query languages in data streams, which is quite challenging area. And I just wanted to see if there was any commonality in the type of work that I've done. Aside from, remember I talked about dropping assumptions in order to create research topics. But then I also talked about how to approach a research topic and how to look at foundations and then implementation. In general, in the foundations area, in data models and query languages, you fight a number of sort of conflicting goals. One of them is expressiveness. How expressive is your model or your language? Another is how simple it is. Simple is good. You might think simple is bad, but simple makes it actually usable. People won't make mistakes. Even SQL is obviously too complicated because people are making mistakes. And the last is how efficient it is to implement. And data guides, what I told you about that, I would say lies at the, at the border of expressiveness and simplicity, but was not efficient. I didn't go into much detail, but if that, it was not efficient in some cases. The stream query language, which we didn't have time for, is expressive and efficient, but not simple. And part of what I would show, you can see there is how complicated queries can get in that setting. I do feel like the model for uncertain data um, cat, well, did pretty well at getting there at the intersection of expressiveness, simplicity, and efficiency. And I will also say trying to balance these goals has been a theme of much of the work that I've done. Thank you.